أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم <تصفيق> الحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين والصلاة والسلام على نبي الأمي العربي القرشي الهاشمي المدني الأبتهي الطهامي السيد البهي والسراج المضي والكوكب الدري صاحب الوقار والسكينة المدفون بأرض المدينة العبد المعيد والرسول المسدد المصطفى الأمجد المحمود الأحمد حبيب إله العالمين وخاتم النبيين وسيد المرسلين وشفيع المذنبين ورحمة للعالمين أبي القاسم محمد صل على ثم الصلاة والسلام على آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين الميامين المذلومين واللعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين من يوم عداوتهم إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كتابه وهو أصدق القائلين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا أطيئوا الله وأطيئوا الرسول وأولي الأمر منكم صلاة الله محمد وعلى محمد صلى على محمد Tonight we have gathered to mark our loss of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. And the subject of our discussion is the concept of imamat in Islam. This will be our subject tomorrow night as well. Before I get into the subject itself, I would like to mention that when discussing this, I, in addition to my Shia brothers and sisters, I have two other groups in mind as my audience. One group that I wish to address as well in this subject are those non-Shia or Sunni Muslim brothers and sisters who hold the opinion that imamat is a concept that is foreign to Islam, that imamat is a concept that the Shias introduced and that only they believe in this uh, concept. We wish to dispel that doubt tonight, inshallah. The other group that I wish to address as well are those revert Muslims that I come across time and again who after having embraced Islam, when they begin studying the difference between the Shia and the Sunni Muslims, particularly in theology and history, they are so overwhelmed by the differences. And at some point they are fed up and they say, I am a Muslim, I am neither a Shia nor a Sunni. I believe in the Quran, I believe in the Rasul, the rest is just history. This is another group as well that we wish to address. I wish to clarify as well that whilst discussing this subject, because we must refer to history, we will be mentioning personalities that are well known to the Muslims. In no way are, is the intention of these discussions uh, intended to be polemic or to offend anyone. They are, in a sense, if you like, intra-faith dialogue and we hope that these are expressed actually with a lot of sincerity. We wish to bring about an understanding and share our perspective and of course we welcome others to speak from their perspectives as well so that inshallah we may use the personality of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad to bring us closer to each other. I should also mention that because the subject itself requires extensive treatment and it may be difficult to complete the subject in two nights, I may go over by five or ten minutes. Um, this is a reputation I have as well and I do not wish to uh, spoil my reputation. Um, 
and because of the audience that I just mentioned, I will not be discussing imamat from a Shia theology perspective. I will be discussing it from actually a non-Shia perspective, but inshallah it is relevant to all of us as well, if you can recite as ala Muhammad wa Muhammad wa So without any delay then, we get into the subject right away. First and foremost, we define what we mean by an imam. When we say imam, we do not mean imam in a limited sense. In Islam, the person who leads you in prayer is also called imam of Salatul Jama'ah. But he is imam only for the duration of the prayer. We also do not mean imam in the sense that Muslim use for a scholar who is an expert in a particular field. The Shias have used this in a very limited sense, as for example when they say Imam Khomeini, to mean an individual who was known for his political and religious leadership, and in that sense he is a leader. In the Sunni world this term is very, very common. Imam Ghazali, for example, to refer to someone who is an expert in ethics and morals. Imam Bukhari, Imam Muslim, as experts in hadith or the four schools of fiqh, Imam Shafi, Imam Maliki, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, Imam Abu Hanifa, in that sense, as an expert in a particular science or field. We do not mean Imam in that sense. When we talk of Imam here for tonight and tomorrow, we mean Imam in the sense of the individual who succeeds the Prophet of Islam, who sits in his place, as the guardian of the Islamic legislation or Sharia with the intention of preserving the message of Islam and the Quran and guiding the Muslims in their worldly as well as their religious affair. And when such an individual is established as an Imam, then it becomes obligatory on the Muslims to pay allegiance to such a man, to do his bay'ah and to obey him and to follow him. So we mean Imam in that sense. When you understand the definition of an Imam in that sense, then the next thing that we need to appreciate is that having an Imam is considered to be wajib, obligatory by all Muslims, Shia and Sunni. So this is the first myth we wish to dispel. The hadith that says, Man mata walam ya'rif imama zamanihi mata meetat al jahiliya. One who dies without knowing the imam of his time dies the death of jahiliya is not a Shia hadith only. It is acknowledged as an authentic hadith by the Shia and the Sunni. Keep in mind that when this hadith uses the word jahiliya, even though it comes from jahala, which means ignorance, it refers to ayyam al-jahiliyyah, which is the days before Islam, the days of ignorance, which was the days of kufr. So one who dies without knowing the imam of his time, dies the death of jahiliyyah, does not mean dies the death of one who is ignorant. No, it means he dies the death of one who is an infidel, who is the death of kufr. Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, who is one of the Imams of the four schools of fiqh and held in high regard, he reports a hadith in his Musnad which is even stronger than this hadith. He does not say one who dies without knowing the Imam of his time. He says, Man mata bighayri imamin mata meetat al jahiliya. One who dies without an Imam dies the death of ignorance. Not one who does not know his imam, one who does not have an imam. Having an imam is so important in Islam that Muslim scholars, not from the Shias, believe that this chain of imama continued until the 3rd of March 1924. They say after the Prophet there were four caliphs, the Khulafa al-Rashidun. After them the Banu Umayyah ruled after them the Banu Abbas, after them the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire disbanded after the First World War when Kamal Ataturk in Turkey, because the Ottomans were the Turks, 
he disbanded and removed the concept of Khilafat and Imamat on the 3rd of March 1924. Thereafter, Muslims have continued calling for the need to revive the institution of Khilafat and Imamat. You can search on the internet. Those of you who are from India and Pakistan, you know about the Khilafat movement. Search Khilafat movement. You will see the attempts that have been made. There are websites dedicated to this. Look at Khalifa.com, for example, that is calling for the restoration of Khilafat. There are websites that have counters. How many days Muslims have continued living without an Imam and a Khalifa? And they say, for these many days, Muslims are committing a sin because they have not pledged allegiance to anyone. And all these who die without an Imam are answerable before Allah. I wish to emphasize this point once more. Because I know there are groups who believe, perhaps out of ignorance, that Imamat is a Shia concept. The Caliph Umar ibn al-Khattab had a son called Abdullah, well known in history, Abdullah ibn Umar. He was not fond of Imam Ali and he refused to pay, pledge allegiance to Imam Ali as well. When the Umayyads came to rule, and one of their caliphs after Yazid, shortly after him, was Marwan. When Marwan's son, when Marwan died and his son Abdul Malik became the caliph, and Abdullah ibn Umar found out that he has been appointed as the caliph, he said, I must pledge allegiance right now to the caliph so that if I die tonight, I do not die without an imam. And he at the time was in Iraq where the governor of Abdul Malik was Hajjaj. Many of you may have heard of Hajjaj ibn Yusuf al thaqafi Hajjaj was a tyrant. His favorite pastime was to kill the Shia. When he was bored, he used to say, I feel like killing a Shia of Ali today. He is the man who killed Kumail ibn Ziyad, the companion of Imam Ali from whom we recite Dua Kumail. He is the man who killed Qambar. He is the man who killed Saeed ibn Jubair. He killed thousands and thousands of Sadat and Shias. He was the governor of Abdul Malik. So Abdullah ibn Umar said, I must go and give my allegiance to Hajjaj as the governor of the caliph so that I do not die without an imam. Now listen to this. This is from the books of history, not from our history. By the way, before I continue, a very important point I wish to make here. When you talk of the history of the Prophet before and immediately after him, we call the history of the Prophet the Seerah, the Seerah of Rasulullah, the history of the Prophet is called. Shias have not written a lot of Seerahs of the Prophet. We do have history of the Prophet in our books of Ahadith from the Ahlul Bayt But most of the Seerah or history of the Prophet has been written by non-Shia historians. So a lot and almost all the history that we present regarding the Prophet is not from us. From Tariq al-Tabari, from Sirah ibn Hisham, from Tariq ibn Athir, from Tariq ibn Kathir, from Tabaqat ibn Sa'ad. The host of them, they are not Shias. Neither is this narration. So Abdullah ibn Umar says, it is night time, but I have to go pledge allegiance. Because I cannot spend a night without having allegiance to an imam. He goes to the palace of Hajjaj. Hajjaj is sleeping. Because of his position and influence, he gains access to the chambers of Hajjaj. He comes to the room where Hajjaj is sleeping. Hajjaj wakes up and says, what do you want, Abdullah? He says, I need to pledge allegiance right now. Hajjaj cannot be bothered to wake up from his sleep. He sticks his foot out. He says, here, you can pledge allegiance to my foot. And the narrations say that Abdullah ibn Umar went and took hold of Hajjaj's foot and did bay'ah to his foot and said, bear witness, I have done bay'ah to a caliph so that if I was to die, I would die a believer. This is given to us by Ibn Abil Hadid in his Sharh of Nahjul Balagha. Ibn Abil Hadid al-Mu'tazali, he is not a Shia. The purpose of narrating this is to say what? Is to say that Muslims have always believed 
that having an imam is absolutely mandatory. You cannot live as a Muslim unless you have pledged allegiance to someone. Your bay'ah, your neck, so to speak, is not free. It is tied to an imam at all times. So now we take this discussion to the next step. We say in that case then, if it is wajib, what are the prerequisites for an imam? What qualities should an imam have? The Shias have their qualities very plain and clear, but we are not discussing it from a Shia theological perspective tonight. The Shias will tell you the imam has to be the individual who is the most learned at the time, who is the bravest at the time, who is the most just at the time, who is the most pious at the time, who is infallible. It's very clear. When we ask the Sunni theologians, these are called the mutakallimun. Okay? Mutakallim is one who is an expert, a, theo a theologian. When we ask them, what are these qualities? You see, it's one thing to take your understanding of your faith from the internet, and it's another thing to go back to the original sources. These are from the original sources. We are asking not just Sunni scholars who are experts of hadith or tafsir or Quran. These are experts of aqaid, of kalam, ilmul kalam, theologians. Individuals like Abu Bakr al-Baqilani, individuals like At-Taftazani. Okay, these uh, uh, are, are masters. It's like me saying to the Shias, I'm talking of Sheikh Mufid and Allama Hilli and uh, uh, Sheikh Saduq. Okay, these are very, very, someone like Abu Bakr al-Baqilani is a theologian. He is so highly respected. He is an Ash'ari theologian. He was a chief Qadi of the Maliki following. Ibn Taymiyyah, who is seen as the religious head of the Salafis, the Wahhabi uh, uh, um, uh, understanding of religion, which is the dominant faith in Saudi Arabia, it is principled and based on the teachings of Ibn Taymiyyah. Ibn Taymiyyah says about Abu Bakr al-Baqilani, he is the greatest Ash'ari mutakallim to have ever lived, unrivaled and unparalleled by anyone before or after him. He has written 52 volumes just defending the aqidah of the Sunni madhab. We are asking him and individuals of his caliber, what are the qualities of an imam? Some of the qualities they do not agree upon. They are not common across all the theologians. Some of the qualities are common. The uncommon qualities are, for example, he must be a man, he must be just, he must be free, uh, he must be sane, um, he must be sound in his limbs and his speech and his hearing, he must be courageous. This is not common across all of them. Some say he must be, some say he doesn't have to be courageous. There are four qualities that all of them say he must possess an imam. The first quality an imam must possess, according to the Sunni theologians, is that he must have a Qurayshi descent. He must be a descendant from the tribe of Quraysh. The second quality he must have is he must be very knowledgeable. According to Al-Baqilani, he must be at least of the level of a judge, so that he can sit in a court and judge as a Muslim Qadi, as a Muslim judge. According to other theologians like Abdul Qadir al-Baghdadi, al-Mawardi and Taftazani, they say he must at least be a mujtahid, meaning he is capable of deriving independent judgment and Islamic laws, of doing ijtihad. That's the second quality, knowledge. The third quality is he must have extensive experience with war planning. He must be able to organize the Muslim troops and to defend the Muslim territories. So he must have experience in war. He can't be someone who used to run away from the battlefield, for example. Okay. The fourth quality is he must be God-fearing and he must be pious. And he must be just. That is also a common, actually, principle. Why? So that he can avenge the rights of the oppressed and avenge them against the unjust. These are the four qualities. Furthermore, to emphasize the fact that having an imam is wajib, At-Taftazani now, who is also a theologian, a famous theologian, I quote word for word. He says, we have mentioned 
in the books of jurisprudence, that means the books of fiqh, that the Muslim ummah has no choice but to have an imam who will protect the sharia, who will establish the sunnah, and who will avenge the oppressed. So it's very, very clear that the ummah has to have an imam. And these are the qualities of the imam. Now we observe two things here. One thing we observe is that the number of conditions for an imam are not standard from one theologian to another. They are varying. Which leads us to believe that there is no conviction that the Prophet of Islam had clarified what the prerequisites for an imam are. That is why there is this difference of opinion. And the second thing that we understand from this is that because there is no clear guidelines from their perspective from the Prophet of Islam, therefore these principles are based on personal judgment from intellectual consideration, perhaps from looking at precedents of some of the previous Khulafa, maybe the Khulafa Rashidun, and from using a principle in Sunni Fiqh that is called Al-Istihsan, which is to use your personal discretion in legal judgments. Fair enough. Now we ask the theologians, the Sunni theologians, tell us what is it that nullifies the imamat of an imam? What cancels the imamat of an imam? And I apologize if this is a little dry, but this is very, very important. I need to quote what they say, and I will only make three quotations here from the most famous theologians. Al-Baqilani tells us, and this is a word-for-word -word translation from the Arabic. I have the references if anyone wishes to, to, to have them. An imam is not divested of his position due to his sinfulness or his injustices in usurping the property of others, nor by his hurting people or taking innocent lives or squandering the rights of others, or obstructing justice. His imamat is not cancelled. And it is not permissible to rise against him. Instead, it is necessary to admonish him, to make him fearful of God, and to forsake his obedience in a sinful matter that he calls for. at tahawi another theologian, he says, and we do not accept the rising against our imams. Those vested with authority. Those vested with authority comes from the ayah of Quran that I recited. From Surah An-Nisa, chapter 4, verse 59, where Allah says, أَطِيُوا Allah wa أَطِيُوا Rasul wa أُولِي amri minkum." Obey Allah and obey the messenger and obey the one vested with authority amongst you. And there is a whole tafsir discussion on this because the word أَطِيُوا is used separately for Allah once. And then it is used once only for the Prophet and the Ulil Amr, which means all the, uh, the, the exegetes, the Mufassirun agree that because the word Ati'u has been used once for Rasul and for Ulil Amr, therefore the Ulil Amr must be obeyed in the same manner as Rasul. So now at Tahawi says, We do not accept the rising against our Imams, those vested with authority. Even if they deviate or they tyrannize, and we do not curse them nor pull back from obeying them, and we see obedience to them as an obligation, as obedience to Allah, the mighty and exalted, as long as they do not command us to sin. We pray for their goodness, whether they are righteous or whether they are fasik, transgressors. Nothing nullifies or revokes them. Okay? And finally, at Taftazani says, An Imam is not dismissed by his sinfulness, nor by oppressing God's creatures. This is because, now here is the reason why. This reason is very important. The reason why he is not dismissed as an Imam, despite oppressing God's creation, or by committing sins openly, this is because sinfulness manifested and injustices spread from the Imams and the Emirs after the rightly guided Caliphs, after the first four Caliphs, and our predecessors submitted to them and accepted them. That is why we do not rise against them. In other words, we take the Salaf 
as an example for us. To put it in modern terms, we do not impeach our leaders. Now, we as Shias, of course, objected to this. We said this is impossible. It is impossible that an Imam commits injustices and you keep quiet. They responded by quoting some ahadith that they attributed to the Prophet of Islam that we regard as being forged. And Sahih Muslim has lots of such narrations, two entire chapters just on these sort of narrations. I will quote only one tradition to show you what this tradition was that was attributed to the Prophet. We believe these traditions were forged by the Banu Umayyah. I give you one tradition. This is from Sahih Muslim. The narrator says that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa alayhi Muhammad wa alayhi Muhammad He said Yakunu ba'di a'immatan la yahtaduna bi hudaya wala yastannuna bi sunnati there will come leaders after me who will not guide according to my guidance and who will not practice my practices, my sunnah. And they shall come men after me as your leaders whose hearts will be the hearts of devils in the body of human beings. So the narrator says, Qala Rawi, قُلْتُ كَيْفَ أَصْنَعُ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ إِنْ أَدْرَكْتُ ذَلِكَ I said, what shall I then do, O Messenger of Allah, if I was to meet such a time? قَالَ تَصْمَعْ وَتُطِيعْ لِلْأَمِيرِ He said, listen and obey the commander. And then the Prophet added, وَإِنْ ضَرَبَ ذَهْرَكْ Even if he whips you and hits you on your back, وَأَخَذَ malak And he takes and usurps your possessions. فَاسْمَعْ وَأَطِيْ Listen to him and obey him. This is from Sahih Muslim, volume 6. He has a chapter called the chapter on the command to stay with the majority and another chapter called the chapter concerning those who separate or divide from the Muslims' affairs. These kind of narrations. There is narration from Hassan al-Basri attributed to the Prophet that the Prophet specifically said, Obey the kings of Banu Umayyah wa in jaru wa in dhalamu, even if they oppress you and even if they tyrannize. We, of course, reject these traditions. Now, this, of course, is a whole discussion in itself. But the point we want to make here is that there is an irony if you haven't caught it yet that there were certain prerequisites for an Imam, that the Imam has to be the most knowledgeable, has to be the most just. So now there is a paradox here. The qualities of an Imam is that he must be just. But if the Imam commits injustices, his Imamat is not cancelled. And you must listen and obey to him. And as we shall see in a bit, the Imam must be the most knowledgeable, but even if he is ignorant, you cannot remove him from his Imamat. So, this, of course, is a paradox that needs to be responded, and we don't have the answer to that. So now we went back to our Muslim brothers, and we said, fine, you have told us what the qualities of an Imam must be. You have told us that an Imamat, an Imam's Imamat is never nullified. Now, have we agreed until this point that imam, imamat is wajib? Having an imam is wajib. They say, yes, having an imam is wajib. We say, tell us why is it wajib to have an imam? Why is it obligatory to have an imam? Now listen to this. It's a very involved but an interesting discussion. You see, the Sunni Muslims... In the, in the past, used to be of two theological understandings. They used to have the Ash'aris and the Mu'tazilis. The Mu'tazilis were very close to the Shias in their understanding. They produced some great scholars. The famous Mufassir of Quran, Fakhruddin Razi, was a Mu'tazili. Ibn Abil Hadid, who wrote the Shar of Najul Balagha, was a Mu'tazili. 
But the Mu'tazilites are to all purpose and in, uh, intent extinct now. They're very few, if any. Most, if not all, the Sunni Muslims you meet today are of an Ash'ari understanding. Okay? All of Saudi Arabia follows the Ash'ari school of understanding. So we have three opinions as to why Imamat is wajib. We have the Ash'ari opinion, we have the Mu'tazili opinion, and then we have the Shia opinion. We asked the Ash'aris, why is an Imam, what makes Imamat wajib? They said, Tajibu al-Imama sam'an. Imamat is wajib because we hear of it. Meaning what? Meaning we proved Imamat to be wajib because of history. So we say, how did you prove Imamat is wajib through history? Now here's what they say. They say, the Prophet of Islam did not appoint anyone. After he passed away, Medina was grieving. People were weeping on one side, confused on the other. People thought this is the end of Islam. There was so much shock because people never thought the Prophet would pass away, perhaps. Some of the companions could not believe he had passed away. In particular, all books of history says that Umar ibn al-Khattab pulled out his sword and said, if anyone says Rasulullah has died, I will behead him. And he continued saying that until Abu Bakr came, he went inside, he lifted the cloth, he looked at the face of the Prophet, he confirmed the Prophet has passed away, then he came back, he calmed Umar down, he recited an ayat of Quran, وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا الرَّسُولُ أَفَإِن مَاتَ أَوْ قُتِلَ إِن قَلَبْتُمْ عَلَىٰ أَقَابِكُمْ Muhammad was but a messenger. If he dies or he's killed in battle, will you turn on your heels and die? After saying all that, he said, هَذَا مُحَمَّدٌ عَبْدُ اللَّهِ قَدْ مَاتْ This is Muhammad, the slave of God. He has died. وَأَمَّا رَبُّ مُحَمَّدٍ فَلَنْ يَمُوتْ As for the Lord of Muhammad, he shall never die. In other words, we must now continue to keep this mission alive. We must continue to keep what the Prophet brought and stood for and preserve it and guide the Muslim Ummah. And so because of these historic events, the need for an Imam was felt. This is why Imamat is wajib. Do you understand? Now, we said to them, when was this need felt? When did you feel this need? They say the need was felt almost immediately. So immediate that even the Prophet's body could not be washed. There were eight people only to wash the body of the Prophet and there were only six to bury him. At Ghadir there were 100,000. So the need for an imam was felt with such urgency, with such immediateness, that immediately the Muslims went and gathered at Saqifah and began deciding the fate of the ummah. We say, if this urgency was so great, why didn't the Prophet say anything about it? If it's wujub, if it's being wajib was so great that even the Prophet could not be washed and an imam was needed. How could Allah and his messenger ignore this? This Rasul who has told you that even when you go to the washroom, what is wajib, what is haram, what is makru, what is mustahab, how could he ignore something like this? Now, I want you to listen to this very, very carefully. There are three options. Option number one, Rasulullah appointed someone. Option number two, he was silent. He didn't appoint anyone. Option number three, he specifically, he wasn't silent. He specifically spoke about it, but he said, I am not appointing someone because Allah does not want me to appoint someone. And he wants me to leave this in the affairs of the ummah. Allah will decide himself what will happen next. Now get this very, very clearly in your minds. There is no narration, not even a weak one, neither in the Shia books nor in the Sunni books, that the Prophet of Islam said, I am not appointing someone. If he was silent, he should have at least said, 
Here's why I'm not appointing someone. There is no hadith that he said, I'm not appointing someone. So now you're left with two options. Either he appointed someone or he chose to remain silent. If he appointed someone, who did he appoint? If he would have said, I am not appointing someone, then the natural response to that is people would have asked him, who sh what should we do then? He would have said, choose one yourselves. He would have, they, then the people would have said, what criteria should we use to choose someone? Right? So the only option then, from a non-Shia perspective, is that the Prophet was silent. If the Prophet was silent and did not say anything, then we must assume he did not want anyone appointed. In which case, for the Muslims to appoint someone was bid'ah. We don't use this term too much, but it comes in handy. It is an innovation. It is an innovation, because Rasulullah did not want anyone appointed. If you say it is not bid'ah, then is it sunnah? If it is sunnah, then again it is not wajib. At least you should have washed the body of the Prophet and dealt with it after. They say, no, it couldn't. It had to be dealt with right away. Then it means it's wajib. If it's wajib, then number one, how do you prove it is wajib? From Quran or from Hadith? And number two, if it is wajib, how could Allah and His Messenger neglect something that was wajib? So you come back again to the same question. Now in the interest of time, I have to keep forging ahead. We leave this for a moment. We go to the Mu'tazilis. We say to the Mu'tazilis, is Imamat wajib? They say, yes. How do you prove Imamat is wajib? They say, tajibul imama aqlan. Imamat is wajib based on reasoning, not based on history. Very good. Reasoning. We like reasoning. So now we say to them, our response. If Imamat is wajib based on reasoning, based on whose reasoning? Your reasoning or the reasoning of Rasulullah? If you say that your reasoning determined that Imamat was wajib, but the Prophet kept silent, then it means your reasoning is superior to the reasoning of Rasulullah. Because you were able to determine something is wajib, but he was not. You realized it is necessary, it escaped him. And if you say it is wajib based on the reasoning of Rasulullah, then if it was wajib, why did he not say about it? Why was he quiet? So that doesn't appeal to us. So they turn around and say, fine, then you tell us. What makes imamat wajib? We say, imamat is wajib not because of historical reasons, not because of rationalizing, but because it is a lutf of Allah. Now you need to understand the meaning of the word lutf. If you can recite a salawat ala Muhammad wa alayhi I thank you immensely for your patience. But this is important because this is being recorded and this will be of great value to new Muslims and for Muslims who are confused about this issue. I'm not looking to convert or brainwash anybody. I'm just looking to express our understanding. And I know many of you understand this and might be thinking, why are you trying to convince me? I already believe in the concept. But it is important for us to also understand how we come to this understanding and conclusion. The word lutf in Arabic has a different meaning from its meaning in Urdu. It's like the word gharib. In Urdu, gharib is a beggar, somebody who's poor. In Arabic, gharib is a stranger, someone who is away from his home. In Urdu, lutf is something you enjoy. Like when you say lutf agaya. Lutf agaya means maza agaya. In Arabic, lutf means grace. Lutf of Allah is the grace of Allah, benevolence of Allah. Now let me explain it first in basic terms so that you will understand its meaning in relation to imamat. When a child is born, as soon as it comes out of the womb of its mother, the first thing it needs is air to breathe. Allah makes that air available for the child to breathe unless a human being interferes and prevents the child from getting that oxygen. 
Now that oxygen to reach the body of that human being, that human being needs nostrils, and then he needs maybe a windpipe, then he needs lungs, then he needs blood to take the oxygenated, oxygenated blood, then he needs a heart to pump, he needs arteries, he needs veins. So Allah makes all these things available for that human being to survive. Then this human being needs food, it doesn't have teeth, it doesn't have the gag reflex, it doesn't have the ability to swallow. So Allah creates food in the mother of the child to sustain this child. These things that Allah makes available, is it wajib for Allah to give the child? Now there is a yes and a no here. If you say yes, then you are trying Allah's hands and saying Allah has to do it. Allah doesn't have to do anything, He is the master. But if you say he doesn't have to do it and he can choose not to do it, then you point a finger at his justice and his mercy. Because if he were not to do it and the child after coming to this world was to die, then Allah would not have been just and kind and merciful to that creation. And for that matter to everything, the son he creates is his lutf. The animals who are born with claws to protect themselves, that's their lutf from Allah. So lutf of Allah or the grace of Allah is that which Allah makes available. That which is not obligatory on Allah to do because nothing is obligatory on him, nothing is wajib on him, but that which is necessary for him to provide because if he does not provide, it points fingers at his justice. That is called lutf. So we say imamat is lutf from Allah. What we mean by this is, even though Allah is not compelled to provide an Imam, His justice requires that He makes that available to human beings. Why? Because if Allah has decided He is not sending any more prophets and messengers, and if Allah has decided He is not sending any other revelation, and the Quran is the final revelation, but he wants the world to continue after this messenger, then it is necessary, and if Allah has decided that on the day of judgment, he will reward and punish people based on their practice of what he has revealed, and he, and he considers it his justice to punish you if you disobey the teachings of the Quran, then his justice also demands that he also makes someone available to guide and interpret that Qur'an and preserve its message so that Allah can then truly say on the day of judgment, I was fair and just to you. If he does not make such a person available, then it points fingers at his justice. Because everything cannot be interpreted directly from the Qur'an, even if some of the Sahaba thought, Hasbuna kitab Allah. And there are lots and lots of examples that I can give you. Lots. I'll give you two very quick examples. When Abu Bakr was the caliph, a man was caught for drinking alcohol, wine. He was brought and the caliph wanted to punish him according to Islamic Sharia. But he had to have his day in court. He said to the caliph, I used to live in a community that used to drink wine and we never knew that there was an ayat of Quran about the prohibition of drinking wine. Today was the first time I heard about this ayat of Quran. So when I drank, I didn't know it was haram. And the books of hadith say that the caliph did not know how to deal with this case because the man was right. I'll give you another example. During the caliphate, the second caliphate, the caliphate of Umar ibn al-Khattab, a man came to him and said to him that, O Amir al-Mu'mineen, in Islam there is a law that says if you divorce your wife three times, you cannot take her back. During the days of Jahiliyyah before Islam, I divorced my wife twice. After Islam came and we became Muslims, I have divorced my wife once. So do I still have two more chances or have I used up my three odd chance? It's a valid question. The Caliph could not find the answer in the Quran. He said to him, La anhaka wa la amurak. I neither forbid you nor do I permit you. What do you do with that? It's like the other story of the man who had something in his mouth and he was told, you can't swallow it, you can't spit it out. It just stays in your mouth. But that's another story. 
So there has to be someone who understands Quran after Rasul who can preserve this message and therefore Imamat is the Lutf of Allah. Now if you say Imamat is the Lutf of Allah, then what is the corollary to that? Corollary means if you, if you put forward a theory, then what does that imply? Right? What does that then lead to? Once you say imamat is a necessity from Allah as a grace, then the corollary to that is that the imam cannot be appointed by election or consensus. That imam must also be appointed by Allah. It must also be mansus min Allah, either directly or through his messenger. Because Allah then will know who is able to fulfill his lutf so that no one can point fingers at his justice. So this is our understanding. Now, there is still one discussion I have to make very quick and then I will make a conclusion. I know it has been heavy going and tomorrow night as well it will be heavy going. I have to tell you this because the nature of the subject is such. But this is very, very important. These are the kind of things we want to teach our children in the madrasa as well. So that when they discuss this, we don't want people just saying, oh the Shias break away sect from Islam, believe in their Imams as if it's something fanciful and emotional that we came to conclude. It was a breakaway, it was a political movement, something in history, a group of heretics. No, there are theological proofs for this. There are necessities of religion that depend on this understanding of Imamat. Now, we take our argument back once more. This is the final discussion I'm coming to. We say, we go back to the Ash'ari. The Ash'aris are the majority today. We say to them, fine, for a moment we are going to concede and say, yes, Imamat is wajib because of history. Historic events led to the proof that Imamat is wajib. The Prophet did not appoint anyone. Okay? It's not the lutf of Allah. History made it wajib. Fine. As long as we are agreed it's wajib. Now, the question we have is, how does an Imam become confirmed as the Imam? Supposing today I stand up and say, I'm the Khalifa of Rasulullah, I'm the Imam. There has to be some way of confirming that I am or not. Those initial criteria are of no value because we have seen, I have to be just, but if I'm unjust, my Imamat is not taken away. So we said to them, how do you confirm the Imamat of someone? They say, because the Prophet did not appoint anyone, it means he wanted the Ummah to decide. Therefore, the consensus of the Ummah decides who is the Imam. Fair enough. We said, whose consensus from the Ummah? Because the Ummah is a large crowd, even in the time of the Prophet. There was Muslims in Medina, in Basra, in Kufa, all over the place. Right? So, whose consensus? They say, those people who have prominence, authority, and influence in the community, their consensus is what matters. These people in Arabic are called Ahlul Hilli Wal Aqd. This is a good term to remember. Al Hilli Wal Aqd, Al Halli Wal Aqd. Hal is to untie something, right? To open, like you use Hal of a Mushkil, for example, right? Hal is to untie. Aqd is to tie. So Al-Halli Wal-Aqd, Ahl Al-Halli Wal-Aqd are the people who untie and tie. It's just an expression. So in every community, even if you look at this community for example, you might have the chairman, you might have the vice chairman, the secretary and all the people who have positions. And then you'll have some people who don't have a position. But they have a status in the community and a certain influence so that if they stand and speak, the community listens. And they can guide the community in a particular direction. And the leaders would respect their opinion. These are the Ahlul Halli Wal Aqd, the people who untie and tie. So they said, these are the people who will decide. We said, fair enough. We agree with that as well. How many from Ahlul Halli Wal Aqd do you need to confirm an Imam? So the initial theologian said, five. He said, five? How did you get the number five? They said, when the Caliph Umar was dying, he appointed six people as a shura and said, out of you six, decide who will be the caliph amongst you. So five people decided 
that the caliph will be Uthman, even though we don't agree that all five agreed on that, because Imam Ali was one of them. But they say, out of the six, five decided. Therefore, five people of prominence, because Umar chose five prominent people. We said, very well, that's fine as well. But the problem is that when Umar was elected, Abu Bakr elected him on his deathbed alone. So there was no five people, there was only one. So then the theologians changed the rule. They said the consensus of one is enough. Consensus means one person. As long as he's a person of prominence and people respect his view. We said that is fine as well. But the problem is that when Abu Bakr was elected, there was no respect. There was a fight. So there was one individual who chose Abu Bakr, but again there was no the community's respect of the view of that one individual. What happened with Saqifah was that Sa'ad bin Ubada, who was the leader of the Khazraj tribe from the Ansar, set up a meeting. The Ansar wanted to elect Sa'ad as the caliph. In the meantime, Abu Bakr and Umar came to know that there is an election happening. They rushed to the scene to talk to them and start reasoning with them. The Ansar said, we select Sa'ad as our caliph. Abu Bakr stood up and said, you cannot because this has to come from the Muhajir. The Ansar said, if it has to be from the Muhajir, then we will only accept Ali bin Abi Talib. Zubair bin Al-Awam pulled out a sword. This is all from Tariq, not Shia Tariq. I told you the Sira is not from the Shias. Zubair pulled out a sword at Saqifa. He said, I will not put this sword back unless people do buy off Ali. Ali was the only person whose name was being taken in Saqifa, even though he was not there himself. This shows that people had an inclination to that. At this point, there was a commotion. People started arguing. The books of history say that Umar went and grabbed the sword of Zubair. He struck it on a stone. He broke the sword. They started calling each other names. The books of history says the Muslims behaved like the days of Jahiliyyah. Umar called Zubair a dog as well. He said, Alaykum bil kalb. He pounced upon Sa'ad. Sa'ad was beaten. His ribs were broken. He died after a few days. In this commotion, in this fighting, what Umar did was, he said to Abu Bakr, extend your hand. Abu Bakr extended his hand. Umar put his hand and said, I do buy out of him. Now the Ansar were two tribes. As soon as he did, the person sitting next to him, he did buy out. Then the next person did buy out. Now the tribe of Aus began doing buy out of Abu Bakr. So those people of Khazraj said, now if we don't do buy out, we'll get left behind. So they started doing it. In that commotion, an election took place. Later on, when Umar became the caliph, he is reported to have said in the history books of the Muslims, and I quote his words, he says, Wallahi inna amra bay'ata abi bakrin kana faltatan. I swear by Allah, the affair of the allegiance to Abu Bakr was a mistake, was an error, and was a big mess. It was a falta. Faltatan is, you can check the dictionary. It means it's, it's, a, it's an error. It's a mistake. فَوَقَ اللَّهُ الْعُمَّةِ مِنْ شَرِّهَا But Allah protected the ummah from its evil. And if anyone attempts to do anything like that again, I will behead him. Okay? This is what happened at Saqifah. So we come back to our discussion. We say, well, if you need one person's consensus, but that one person has to be respected unanimously, that did not happen in the case of Abu Bakr. So then they revise the, the condition. They say, as long as one person pledges allegiance or some people pledge allegiance, it becomes wajib even if the others don't pledge allegiance to him. And now this comes from a very great theologian who is called Al-Juwaini. Al-Juwaini is the teacher of Ghazali. Those of you who take an interest in Islamic history, you know Ghazali is a very great personality in Islam. Imam al-Ghazali, probably the first person to be called Hujjatul Islam al-Ghazali, the author of Ihya Ulumuddin. His teacher is al-Juwaini. Al-Juwaini was known as Imam al-Haramain, Imam of Mecca and Medina. If you speak in Islamic theology and say Imam al-Haramain without taking a name, people know you're talking of al-Juwaini. Al-Juwaini says, consensus is not necessary for an imam's imamat to be confirmed. 
بل تنعقد الامامه وان لم تجمع الامه على عقده but his imamat is confirmed even if the ummah do not unite and agree on his imamat and notice he is not saying khilafat he is saying imamat this is very important now the shias are very hard to keep quiet we said that is also fine we have another question now what do you say about yazid and muawiyah because muawiyah took khilafat by force and treachery so there was not even the one person who was elected by some and opposed by some ma'mun killed his brother Ma amin after his father harun al rashid died in order to get khilafat so now there is no even election of one prominent person even if the muslims are divided on it so now how do you confirm his imamat so finally they said an imam's imamat is confirmed by any standard even if he takes it with force and subjugation and oppression so the mold just broke now completely there is no yardstick now and i want to give you two quotes summarize and then come to masaib the first quote is from al isfaraini al isfaraini is a famous theologian sunni theologian he has a book called ihqaqul haqq he writes in his book ihqaqul haqq imamat is confirmed even with force and subjugation and for those of you who understand arabic he says walau kana fasiqan aw jahilan aw a'jamiyan even if he is a transgressor an open sinner and he is ignorant and he is non arab so these three are fall in one class ignorance transgressors and non arabs any of these because why originally the rule was he must be from quraish and at taftazani whom we mentioned before in his book he says the imamat of an imam is confirmed even bil qahri wal istila with force and subjugation in aqadat al khilafat lahu wa qada idha kana fasiqan aw jahilan his imamat is confirmed even if he is an oppressor if he is an open sinner and he is ignorant in other words what was happening now is a statement to cover the sins of everyone and say even yazid can be ulil amr and obedience to him is like obedience to the prophet the corollary to that is that today the muslims who say radiyallahu an after the name of yazid those who say this they also say that imam hussein was wrong in rising against yazid why because you cannot rise against an imam walau kana fasiqan aw jahilan so hussein did not know the all those ahadith of his grandfather that even if the leader usurps your rights and hits you and whips you isma wa ati listen and obey but these people know that hussein was wrong so i make a few observations and then i have ended i promise the first thing we want to summarize for tonight because we said tonight we're discussing imama from a theological perspective tomorrow from a history perspective the first thing we want to confirm again is that the concept of imamat very very much exists in all the muslims shia and sunni okay the last time a couple of years back i did a search on the internet on the concept of imamat in quran i found an article by an individual who claims he was a shia and then he became a sunni and in that article he writes he says i was a shia and i know how to debate with the shias and he says when you want to defeat the shias don't argue with them about anything don't argue with them about the right of khilafat about ghadir about the marriage of mut'a about this or that you will you will fail the only way to fight the shias is tell them that imamat is something you innovated there is no place for it in islam now obviously he changed too soon because he is not aware of all these theologians and their opinions but imamat is very much a belief in all muslims yes we disagree on the qualities of an imam if you tell me as a non shia that you shias believe your imams are infallible that i accept and there are reasons why we believe that and we will be happy to share those reasons with you 
But don't tell me that Muslims do not believe in the concept of imamat. They are talking about it and using the word imamat, 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 not khilafat only. That is number one. Number two, as we have seen, the rules of how an imam gets elected were reverse engineered. Do you understand the term reverse engineered? Meaning, instead of setting the rules and saying these are the qualities of an imam, and then saying who fits this bill, does Ja'far al-Sadiq fit this bill that he should be our imam? The way it was done was the other way around. Look who became the imams. And then whoever became the imams, look at their qualities. Those are the qualities and the prerequisites of an imam. This reminds me of the saying that says, if you never want to be wrong, shoot your arrow first, and then whatever you hit, you call that your target. You can never be wrong, because whatever you hit will be bullseye. It's a bit like me and, 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 and uh, hockey, right? I don't understand the game, but my team always wins. Because I don't start cheering like the rest of you before the game starts, and, right? I wait and see who's winning. Whoever's winning, that's my team, right? This is very important to understand how these concepts came into being. Now, I want to say just one thing, and listen to this, how beautifully things work. Look at Allah's power how he makes things come to be. You will be amazed if you have never thought of this point. There are two opinions now in Muslims. Either the Prophet appointed someone, or he didn't appoint someone. Those who say he appointed someone, they say he appointed Ali bin Abi Talib. There is not a single... There is not a single person who mentions any other name besides the name of Ali. If there is any Muslim of any madhab, of any sect, who believes that the Prophet appointed someone, they only believe it was Ali. There is no second name that is given out in history, that the Prophet mentioned this person. Right? So if you go by those who say the Prophet appointed someone, then the name is Ali. If you go by those who say the Prophet did not appoint someone, their initial premise is that the Prophet did not appoint someone because he wanted the Ummah to decide who to appoint. The Ummah to come together and unanimously vote for one person. Now the irony and the beauty of this thing is that even by that yardstick, the only person who qualifies is Ali. Think about this for a minute. The Caliph Abu Bakr, I told you. Okay, we are not here to curse, abuse anybody. This is history. The Caliph Abu Bakr was chosen at Saqifa amidst a lot of disagreement. There was no unanimity there. Because Sa'ad bin Ubadah, a very prominent member, uh, and Sahaba was opposing it. His son Qais opposed it. Habab bin Munzir who was there opposed it. Zubair bin Al-Awam opposed it. Imam Ali opposed it. The Banu Hashim opposed it. The Khazraj tribe opposed it. So there was no unanimous vote for him. The Caliph Umar was appointed by Abu Bakr on his deathbed. So there was no, again, unanimous vote by the Muslims. The Caliph Uthman was appointed by Shura with five or six people. Now the Caliph Uthman was murdered and he was not, he did not stay for any time. He died immediately. So there was no time for him to appoint anyone. The Muslims thronged at the door of Ali and said, you have to be our Caliph and our Imam. And he said, wait for three days and think about it. After three days, they still came to his door to the point that Ali says in Nahjul Balagha, they almost crushed my toes. After Ali, there was again never a vote like this for the Banu Umayyah and Banu Abbas. The only person who opposed Ali was Muawiyah in Damascus. But all the other Muslim regions voted for him. So even if you go by the measure that the Prophet did not appoint anyone, and he wanted the Muslims to unanimously decide on someone, out of all the caliphs who have come in Islamic history, the only person who fit that bill was Ali bin Abi Talib. Salawatullahi wa salam. Oh, ala. Ma salli ala. Wa ali Muhammad. So Allah works in mysterious ways. And inshallah tomorrow night, I will again talk to you the issue of imamat from history and give you ample evidence from history why and how many times Ali was appointed. How many times? See, just before coming to the mosque, I was watching uh, um, 
uh, uh, the Ahlul uh, Bayt channel, and somebody asked a question to, to one of the scholars there and said, if Khilafat was so important, why did the Prophet wait until his deathbed to ask for a paper and pen? Why didn't he appoint months ahead or years ahead? I will tell you tomorrow night how many times he mentioned Ali. The fact, it's a good question, but the fact that the Prophet mentioned give me a paper and pen shows that even the Prophet was losing hope that people will follow his previous instructions. And it goes beyond that. Tomorrow, inshallah, during the day, we have paying tribute to the Prophet and Masaib. So we will talk about this in more detail. Where, at what point did people start opposing the Prophet and started standing in the way of what he intended? and trying to wrest power and control from his hands. A week before the passing away of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad, when the Prophet of Islam realized that now there will be opposition, he as a last strategy trying to free Medina, he sent Usama bin Zayd the son of Zayd bin Harith, who was a freed slave and the adopted son of Rasulullah, out on an expedition. He said to the Muslims, all of you go with Osama on this expedition to Tabuk, except for Ali. The Muslims refused to go. At first they made excuses and said, Osama is too young, he is only 18 years old. How did Rasulullah appoint us to follow such a young lad? As the days came closer, we are told that the Prophet of Islam began falling ill. He started having severe headaches at first. Then again, the Prophet started saying, go to the Jaish of Usama. The Muslims began saying, we are concerned about the health of the Prophet. We will not go. At one point, Rasulullah cursed those who did not go. He said, La'anallahu man takhallafa Jaish Usama. May Allah curse those who do not go with Usama. Yet, the Muslims refused to go. Look at the opposition flying in the face of Rasulullah. The days came by, all Muslim historians say that regardless of the date that they disagree on, Rasulullah passed away on a Monday soon after the time of Zahr. The Thursday before he passed away, he fell ill considerably. A large number of companions gathered in the house of Rasulullah out of concern for him perhaps, and out of to see what was happening to him. At one point, Rasulullah opened his eyes and saw his room filled with his companions and with people around him. He said to them, give me a paper and a pen, and a pen that I may write something for you so that you will never go astray after me, so that you will never be divided after me. What more could you want, O Muslims, than this from your Prophet? Every man has this right that when he is dying, you listen to his will. Can you imagine somebody dying, a stranger, telling you, I am dying, I wish to make a will, and that you turn him away? All Rasulullah wanted was a paper and a pen. At this point, all history books record that Umar ibn al-Khattab stood up. He did not say, he said, the Prophet is speaking nonsense, na'udhu billah. But he did not say the Prophet is speaking nonsense. He said the man is uttering nonsense. Inna rajulun la yahjur. He is delirious with fever. He does not know what he is saying. A commotion began in the room of the Prophet. The women behind the curtain saying, give the Prophet something to write. Give him, it is his last wish. And here Umar is saying, hasbuna kitab Allah. The book of God is enough for us. We do not want to know what he is saying. Voices were raised, shouting at each other. The Prophet got upset, he began reciting the Qur'an, he began saying, Ya ladina amanu, la tarfau aswatakum fawqa sawtin nabi. O you who believe, do not raise your voices above the voice of the Prophet. At this point, the Prophet was so upset with the people, that he said to them, Qumu anni, get out from here, all of you. Can you imagine Rasulullah saying this? Get out from here, all of you. Now people ask, why did the Prophet not insist and say, give me a paper, I still want to write? There is a reason why he did not do that. Because once you have accused him of being taken with fever and uttering nonsense, now anything he writes, you will say he wrote this when he was not in his senses. 
So what was the point of writing it at that point? Kumu anni. This was such a calamity, this was such a calamity, my dear brothers and sisters, that Imam Bukhari mentions this incident in five different places. It is known as Raziyatu Yawmul Khamis, the calamity of the Thursday. And he, Bukhari, mentions that when people would ask Abdullah ibn Abbas after the passing away of the Prophet, tell us about this incident of the paper and the pen. He says Abdullah ibn Abbas would sit in the mosque of the Prophet, he would cry and he would cry and he would cry until his beard would be wet with his tears and the pebbles below him would get wet with his tears. He would say, Alas, Raziyatu Yawmul Khamis, the calamity of the Thursday. If only, if only we would have allowed the Prophet to write something for us. Now that people had left and the Prophet was left alone, who was he left with now? He was left with Ali, he was left with Fatima, he was left with Hassan, he was left with Hussein. We are told in one narration that Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein came running towards their Jad, towards Rasulullah. Imam Ali tried to hold the little boys back from Rasulullah. Rasulullah said to Ali, O oh Ali, da'ahum ashummahuma wa yashummani. O oh Ali, let my grandsons come to me. Let me smell their scent for the last time. O oh Rasulullah, you do not know what will happen to your grandchildren after you. We are told Hassan came to Rasulullah. He placed his cheek on the cheek of Rasulullah and began crying and weeping. Hussein placed his head on the chest of Rasulullah. Rasulullah put his arms around his grandsons. He wept with them for a while. Fatima sat beside Rasulullah. Ali had the head of Rasulullah in his laps. Fatima is now remembering perhaps the days she sent with her father. Rasulullah used to call her Umm Abiha. She was like a mother to her father. All the days of Tabligh when Rasulullah used to go out to preach. When people would take thorns and line them on the streets so that they should hurt Rasulullah. When people would go to their rooftops and throw filth on Rasulullah. It was Fatima who would sit with her father. When people would throw rocks at Rasulullah and he would come home bleeding. It was Fatima who would sit and treat her father's wounds. It was Fatima who would sit and remove the thorns from her father's feet. Fatima is sitting there weeping and looking at Rasulullah. Rasulullah opens his eyes and looks at Fatima. Why are you crying my dear daughter? Fatima says, I'm crying because of separation from you. Rasulullah says something to Fatima after which she smiles. Later on she says, Rasulullah promised me I will be the first one to meet him after his demise. In a little while a knock is heard on the door. Fatima hears a very strange voice saying, Ana rajulun gharib. Fatima hears the voice of a stranger. She says to him, return, may Allah have mercy on you. Rasulullah is not able to see anyone. A little time passes, again somebody knocks on the door. Gharibun yasta'adhinu ala Rasulullah. A stranger has come asking permission to see Rasulullah. Now the messenger of Allah opens his eyes. He says, oh Fatima, do you not know who this is? This is Malakul Maut, oh Fatima. It is the sharaf and the honor of your house, oh Fatima, that the angel of death asks permission. I would say, ya Rasulullah, this door that the angel of death asks permission for. Come and see this door three days from now when there is firewood at the door and it is being burnt. Fatima opened the door and welcomed the angel of death. She says something came in that sounded like the whispering of a breeze. It came close to us and said, Assalamu alaikum ya ahla baytin nubuwa. O oh, angel of death, you do salam to ahl al bayt. In a few days there will be no one to return the salam of Ali. <laughs> Rasulullah, Jibreel asked Rasulullah, O oh, Ahmad, Allah has given you the choice if you wish to remain. The last words of Rasulullah, he says, Bal ila rafiq al-a'la. Nay, I wish to return to my exalted friend. He turns and looks to Ali as he takes his last breath. Ali puts his hand at the mouth of Rasulullah. He takes the breath of Rasulullah and wipes it on his face. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Ali turns to the women in the house and says, A'zam Allahu ujurakum bi nabiyyikum. May Allah reward you for your grief over your messenger. For Allah has taken his messenger to him. The women began crying. The voices were heard into the mosque. A commotion began in the house of Rasulullah. Ali was left with Rasulullah. The Muslims came briefly to confirm Rasulullah has passed away. Then they all went to Saqifa. I told you only eight were left to help Ali wash the body of Rasulullah. Ali is washing the body of Rasulullah and crying. 
ما أعظم المصيبة علينا حيث فقدناك وحيث إن قطع عنا الوحي فإنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون Ali began crying or oh, what a calamity has befallen us that the revelation has been separated from us from Allah or oh, what calamity has befallen us that we have lost Rasulullah the time came to bury Rasulullah you can imagine how Fatima was hurt when she realized there was only six people to bury her father I would say oh Fatima still be grateful to Allah there are six people to bury your father oh Fatima when you pass away it will be in the middle of the night there will be no one to come to your funeral oh Fatima when Ali is buried he will be he will be buried in hiding oh Fatima when Hassan is buried when Hassan wishes to be buried his body will be pierced with arrows and be brought back to the house again oh Fatima come to Karbala ten years later there will be no one to bury your Hussein Umar ibn Saad will place the body of your Hussein and say trample the body of Hussein everyone will come forward and take the body of their family members and loved ones there will be no one to say someone save the body of the son of Fatima someone give a shroud and a burial to the son of Fatima ala la'anatullahi ala al-qawm al-zalimeen wa saya'alamu al-lazina zalamu ayyamun qalabin yanqalibun wa muhammada wa aliyya ma'atam to bring us closer to each other. I should also mention that because the subject itself requires extensive treatment and it may be difficult to complete the subject in two nights, I may go over by five or ten minutes. Um, this is a reputation I have as well and I do not wish to uh, spoil my reputation. Um, and because of the audience that I just mentioned, I will not be discussing imamat from a Shia theology perspective. I will be discussing it from actually a non-Shia perspective, but inshallah it is relevant to all of us as well, if you can recite a salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So without any delay then, we get into the subject right away. First and foremost, we define what we mean by an imam. When we say Imam, we do not mean Imam in a limited sense. In Islam, the person who leads you in prayer is also called Imam of Salatul Jama'ah. But he is Imam only for the duration of the prayer. We also do not mean Imam in the sense that Muslims use for a scholar who is an expert in a particular field. The Shias have used this in a very limited sense, as for example when they say Imam Khomeini, to mean an individual who was known for his political and religious leadership, and in that sense he is a leader. In the Sunni world this term is very, very common. Imam Ghazali, for example, to refer to someone who is an expert in ethics and morals. Imam Bukhari, Imam Muslim, as experts in hadith or the four schools of fiqh, Imam Shafi, Imam Maliki, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, Imam Abu Hanifa, in that sense, as an expert in a particular science or field. We do not mean Imam in that sense. When we talk of Imam here for tonight and tomorrow, we mean Imam in the sense of the individual who succeeds the Prophet of Islam, who sits in his place, as the guardian of the Islamic legislation or Sharia ah, with the intention of preserving the message of Islam and the Quran and guiding the Muslims in their worldly as well as their religious affair and when such an individual is established as an Imam then it becomes obligatory on the Muslims to pay allegiance to such a man to do his bay'ah ah, and to obey him and to follow him. So we mean Imam in that sense. When you understand the definition of an Imam in that sense, then the next thing that we need to appreciate is that having an Imam is considered to be wajib, obligatory by all Muslims, Shia and Sunni. So this is the first myth we wish to dispel. The hadith that says, Man mata 
ولم يعرف إمام زمانه مات ميتة الجاهلية One who dies without knowing the Imam of his time dies the death of Jahiliya is not a Shia hadith only. It is acknowledged as an authentic hadith by the Shia and the Sunni. Keep in mind that when this hadith uses the word Jahiliya, even though it comes from Jahala, which means ignorance, it refers to Ayyam al Jahiliya, which is the days before Islam the days of ignorance, which was the days of kufr. So one who dies without knowing the imam of his time, dies the death of jahiliya, does not mean dies the death of one who is ignorant. No, it means he dies the death of one who is an infidel, who is the death of kufr. Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, who is one of the imams of the four schools of fiqh, and held in high regard, he reports a hadith in his Musnad, which is even stronger than this hadith. He does not say one who dies without knowing the Imam of his time. He says, Man mata bighayri imamin mata al jahiliya. One who dies without an Imam dies the death of ignorance. Not one who does not know his Imam, one who does not have an Imam. Having an Imam is so important in Islam that Muslim scholars, not from the Shias, believe that this chain of Imama continued until the 3rd of March 1924. They say after the Prophet there were four Caliphs, the Khulafa al-Rashidun, after them the Banu Umayya ruled, after them the Banu Abbas, after them the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire disbanded after the First World War when Kamal Ataturk in Turkey, because the Ottomans were the Turks, he disbanded and removed the concept of Khilafat and Imamat on the 3rd of March 1924. Thereafter, Muslims have continued calling for the need to revive the institution of Khilafat and Imamat. You can search on the internet. Those of you who are from India and Pakistan, you know about the Khilafat movement. Search Khilafat movement. You will see the attempts that have been made. There are websites dedicated to this. Look at Khalifa.com, for example, that is calling for the restoration of Khilafat. There are websites that have counters. How many days Muslims have continued living without an Imam and a Khalifa? And they say, for these many days, Muslims are committing a sin because they have not pledged allegiance to anyone. And all these who die without an imam are answerable before Allah. I wish to emphasize this point once more. Because I know there are groups who believe, perhaps out of ignorance, that imamat is a Shia concept. The Caliph Umar ibn al-Khattab had a son called Abdullah, well known in history, Abdullah ibn Umar. He was not fond of Imam Ali and he refused to pay, pledge allegiance to Imam Ali as well. I would like to mention that when discussing this, I, in addition to my Shia brothers and sisters, I have two other groups in mind as my audience. One group that I wish to address as well in this subject are those non-Shia or Sunni Muslim brothers and sisters who hold the opinion that imamat is a concept that is foreign to Islam, that imamat is a concept that the Shias introduced and that only they believe in this uh, concept. We wish to dispel that doubt tonight, inshallah. The other group that I wish to address as well are those revert Muslims that I come across time and again who after having embraced Islam, when they begin studying the difference between the Shia and the Sunni Muslims, particularly in theology and history, they are so overwhelmed by the differences. And at some point they are fed up. And they say, I am a Muslim, I am neither a Shia nor a Sunni. I believe in the Quran, I believe in the Rasul, the rest is just history. This is another group as well that we wish to address. 
I wish to clarify as well that whilst discussing this subject, because we must refer to history, we will be mentioning personalities that are well known to the Muslims. In no way are, is the intention of these discussions uh, intended to be polemic or to offend anyone. They are, in a sense, if you like, intra-faith dialogue. And we hope that these are expressed actually with a lot of sincerity. We wish to bring about an understanding and share our perspective. And of course, we welcome others to speak from their perspectives as well, so that inshallah, we may use the personality of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillahi ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Bari al-khalaiqi ajma'in. والصلاة والسلام على نبي الأمي العربي القرشي الهاشمي المدني الأبتهي الطهامي السيد البهي والسراج المضي والكوكب الدري صاحب الوقار والسكينة المدفون بأرض المدينة العبد المعيد والرسول المسدد المصطفى الأمجد المحمود الأحمد حبيب إله العالمين وخاتم النبيين وسيد المرسلين وشفيع المذنبين ورحمة للعالمين أبي القاسم محمد صل على ثم الصلاة والسلام على آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين الميامين المذنومين واللعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين من يوم عداوتهم إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كتابه وهو أصدق القائلين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا أطيعوا الله وأطيعوا الرسول وأولي الأمر منكم صلاة الله محمد وعلى محمد صلى على محمد Tonight we have gathered to mark our loss of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. And the subject of our discussion is the concept of imamat in Islam. This will be our subject tomorrow night as well. Before I get into the subject itself.